so blessed to have the Dixie Echoes with us today, uh, Randy, Randy, Chandler, and Stephen, and uh, they'll be coming back up to lead us in our invitation in a little bit. If you have your Bible, may I invite you to open with me to the book of Revelation. We welcome all of you to the service today. We welcome also those of you who are sharing this service by means of television. You are worshiping with the First Baptist Church in Fort Walton Beach, Florida. And uh, this is the pastor bringing the message in our continuation of a series through the book of Revelation. And today we're in chapter 18, verses 1 and 2. And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of demons, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. We live in a time of great financial and economic uncertainty. Young people go to college and graduate and can't find a job that will enable them to repay their student debt. Older people who have been planning to live on interest earned in their certificates of deposit have been through a time where interest rates have been low and earning enough through those CDs has been very difficult. I heard this week that if you look at the treasury certificates of all the governments on the face of this earth, not just our own, that 30% of the treasury certificates in this world pay negative interest. That means the interest you would earn is less than the cost of living increase year by year. So we live in times of financial difficulty and times of financial uncertainty. And I don't know about you, I'm, I grow weary of commercials. The economy's going to collapse, buy gold, buy silver. And that has not, over the long term, been such a good investment either. The Bible says that there is coming a day when Jesus will come and take his church out of the world. After that time, Antichrist is going to come to power and reign. But toward the end of his reign, there will indeed be an economic and financial collapse when the judgment of God falls. And that's the title of the message, The Coming Collapse. Now this portion of Revelation really begins in chapter 16. When a seventh angel pours out a bowl of wrath upon the earth, he pours it out upon the air. So in chapter 16, you see the overthrow of Satan's domain, the air. He's called in Scripture the prince of the powers of the air. In chapter 17, you see the overthrow of Satan's religious system which is pictured as a red harlot. In chapter 18 that we're studying today, you see the overthrow of Satan's financial system, business system, the coming collapse. In chapter 19, at the Battle of Armageddon, the overthrow of Satan's armies. And in chapter 20, with the binding of the devil the overthrow of Satan himself. And then in chapters 21 and 22, the new heavens, the new earth, the new Jerusalem, the new home of the soul. But chapters 17 and 18 belong together. The destruction of Babylon, 
in chapter 17, mystery Babylon, the Bible calls it, religious Babylon. But in chapter 18, the city Babylon, commercial Babylon. First, let's look at Babylon in prophecy. We have been told now for the third time that Babylon is going to fall. In Revelation chapter 14, verse 8, and there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city. Then in Revelation 16, verse 19, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God. And now in chapter 18, verse 2, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. There are several phrases that occur repetitiously in Revelation 18. Is fallen, is fallen. And by the way, the tense of that verb in the Greek means that Babylon falls suddenly, but that's a repetition is fallen, is fallen. Another phrase that you'll see repetitively is the phrase in one hour. You see it repeated several times in this chapter. And finally, the phrase no more. You see it six times in verses 21 through 23. No more, no more, no more, no more. And in the Greek language, it's the strongest possible way you can say it. You could translate it by no means. Or you could translate it not at all. No more, no more, no more. Now Babylon is mentioned more than any other city in the Bible except Jerusalem. Babylon is mentioned 260 times in the Word of God. In just Jeremiah 50 and 51, Babylon is mentioned 37 times. The city was founded by one of the descendants of Noah. One of Noah's sons was named Ham. Ham's grandson was named Nimrod. And Nimrod founded the city of Babylon. Originally it was called Babel, located on the plain of Shinar. And there men built a tower trying to reach unto God. Notice in Genesis they built a tower trying to reach unto heaven. And now in Revelation her sins reach unto heaven. Babylon is the city where Nebuchadnezzar reigned. Nebuchadnezzar, who invaded Judea, destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the Solomonic Temple. Babylon is the city where Daniel was taken captive. So you see Babylon over and over in the Bible, 260 times. Here in Revelation... In chapter 17, you see religious Babylon destroyed. Religious Babylon is destroyed by human beings. The Bible says that the beast and his ten underlings, his ten confederate states, turn against religious Babylon and destroy her. But in chapter 18, commercial Babylon, Economic Babylon is not destroyed by human beings, but is destroyed by God himself. And when God destroys economic Babylon, you have a twofold reaction in verses 19 and 20. The merchants, the inhabitants of Babylon, the unbelievers say, Alas, alas, that great city. They lament. But on the other hand, verse 20 says, Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and apostles and prophets. When Babylon is destroyed, 
The earthlings, the worldlings lament, but heaven rejoices. And I'm telling you, there would be a twofold response if Jesus came today. The people of God would rejoice and the world would begin to enter tribulation and would begin a time of lamenting. Now, what is Babylon? There are some who say that Babylon is just a symbol and it stands for a system of government and business and commerce controlled by this world. Others say Babylon is not just a symbol, a system. It is a city, but they say, we don't know which city it is, but it's the capital city of the Antichrist and his economic empire. And then there are those who say that literally the city of Babylon will be rebuilt. Maybe the Tigris and Euphrates rivers will be dammed to provide water. There's oil in that part of the world to provide commerce. We see in our day the emergence of the Indian subcontinent coming into four as one of the great powers on the earth. And so some say literally Babylon, the city, will be rebuilt. Most New Testament scholars believe that Babylon here is a symbol of the city of Rome. We say that because in chapter 17, the Bible says that the seven heads of the beast stand for the seven hills on which the city is built. So many believe this is the city of Rome, the capital of Antichrist's empire. But whichever way you take it, and maybe more than one is true, maybe it is a symbol of the world system of evil and it is the center of the Antichrist's commercial empire. And it may be either Rome or Babylon, but the Bible gives Babylon a great place in predictive prophecy. Now notice in Revelation 18, there are four reasons why God judges and destroys Babylon. First of all is her sin in verse 5. For her sins have reached unto heaven and God has remembered her iniquities. God is a holy God. God takes sin seriously. And as less sin is forgiven, God will judge sin. And the only reason sin can be forgiven is that God did judge sin when Jesus Christ went to the cross and died in payment for our transgressions. But Babylon will be judged for her sins. Secondly, she will be judged specifically for her pride and arrogance. Verse 7 reads, How much she has glorified herself and lived deliciously. For she says in her heart, I sit a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow. There is no sin that God detests more than the sin of pride. It's the root sin of all sins. It was for pride that Satan was expelled from heaven. It was with pride that Satan tempted Adam and Eve. If you'll eat of this fruit, you'll be as God's discerning good and evil. It was a temptation to pride. The book of Proverbs says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Jesus, on the other hand, said, I am meek and lowly in heart. And he said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the kingdom, they shall inherit the earth. The Bible says in the book of James, God resists the proud and gives grace to the lowly. And God says 
again in the book of James, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you. And folks, that's a principle that works anywhere in life. If you want to be exalted in athletics or in academics or in music or in business, you humble yourself, you become a student, you learn, you submit to authority, you work hard, and in the long haul, you'll be exalted. But God judges Babylon specifically for the sin of pride. And third, for her greed. In verses 12 and 13, we have a listing of 28 articles of commerce in which Babylon participates, beginning with gold and ending with the souls of men. Isn't that fascinating? Despite all that philosophy has, has said, despite all that preachers have said, despite all that teachers have said, despite all the books that have been written, at the end of time there is still slavery, there is still the devaluation of human life. Now God takes human life seriously. You matter to God. No matter who you are, you are important to God. Human beings were made in God's image. We were made by God. God placed such value on the human soul that Jesus went to the cross and died to redeem us. But the devil devalues human life. And we see the devaluation of human life on scores of fronts in our society. The aborting of little babies. That's a devaluation of human life. Someone takes a truck and drives it in Nice, France into a crowd of people. That's a devaluation of human life. Someone goes into a parking garage with an automatic or a semi-automatic weapon and begins to shoot police officers. That is a devaluation of human life. In northern Africa, Christian villages are raided and their little children are taken off into slavery. To this day, that's a devaluation of human life. And did you know about 15 years ago, here in Fort Walton Beach, Florida, I had an officer from law enforcement make an appointment and come to see me. He was in plain clothes. And he said, I want you to be on your lookout and keep your ear open because I know you have a great number of people from all over the world that visit or are attend First Baptist Church. And he said, we're fighting a great problem of human slavery, human trafficking. Much of it run by the Russian mafia right here in the hotels, in the restaurants of Fort Walton Beach. That was about 15 years ago. And I seriously doubt that that problem has been eradicated the devaluation of human life. That's one reason God pours out his judgment upon Babylon. And then fourth is the persecution of God's saints. In Revelation 18, 24, in her, in Babylon, was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. So, God says, my people, if somebody misunderstands, if somebody mistreats you, if somebody persecutes you, if somebody says ugly things about you or to you, just endure because the day is coming when those who persecute the people of God are going to experience His wrath and His vindication. You don't have to get even. 
The Bible says, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. But what about God's people that live in Babylon? What about those tribulation saints that live in the city? Well, God says in verse 4, I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. Separate yourself from Babylon. And notice there are two reasons that ye be not partakers of her sins, that you not defile yourself, and that you receive not of her plagues, that you not be part of her judgment, that you not be defiled, that you not be destroyed. God says, separate yourself, come out of Babylon. Now God's commission to you and me is not that we come out of our city. God's commission to you and me today is that we are the salt of the earth, we are the light of the world, we are to stay here and bear witness for Jesus. But in our behavior, in our entertainment, in our lifestyles, we are to be separate God's people are always to be a separated people. And separation is both negative and positive. It's separation from evil, but it is equally important. Separation to God. Separation unto the Bible. Separation unto the church. Separation unto love. Separation unto prayer. The Bible says... In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and I will be your God, and you will be, I will be your father, and you will be my sons and my daughters. One of my favorite preachers, until God called him home to heaven, was Dr. Adrian Rogers at Bellevue Baptist Church in Cordova, Tennessee. He used to tell the story of a former member of his church, also in heaven, named Gene McCombs. One day, Gene McCombs was getting ready to disembark from an airliner. He opened the overhead bin to grab his carry-ons, and his hand went into a sack, and there was paper in the sack. And he brought it out and he saw $100 bills. And then he saw there was a second stack. He got the two sacks of money out of the overhead bin. Somebody obviously had gotten off the plane and left the money there, $20,000. I don't think I'd get off the plane and leave that much. And uh, Gene said, I went to the captain of the plane and I said, what do I do? I found this money. He was an honest man. The captain said, come with me. We'll go to an office here in the airport and report this. So they went to the office, filled out the forms, turned in the money. And Gene McCombs said to the officer, what's going to happen to this money? And the officer said, if somebody can come and describe it and tell the amount, they can claim it. But if nobody claims it, you found it. It's yours. And while Gene McCombs was standing in that office, a ragged, unkempt, disheveled man walked in and said to the officer, I left some money on an airplane. He looked like a Street person. And the officer said, could you describe it? Well, $20,000 in $100 bills in two sacks. The officer said, sign for it and it's yours. And the man took his money and he left. And he never said thank you to Gene McCombs for turning in the money. Could have kept it. Never said thank you to the officer. He just left. 
And Gene McCombs said, I left the airport and I found myself resenting that. I got in the cab and I thought the least that fellow could have done was to say thank you. So sitting in the cab, he began to think maybe I should have kept the money. And then I realized that was the devil talking to me. And so I responded back aloud to the devil and I said, you don't understand what I've got in my pocket. And the cab driver thought he meant a gun. The cab driver said, what did you say? He said, well, don't pay me any mind. I was talking aloud to the devil. That didn't make the cab driver feel much better. And Gene said, all the way to my destination, the cab driver kept looking behind me at a man talking aloud to the devil. But the point is, one man's treasure was cash. The other man's treasure was Christ. If you're a Christian, your real treasure is your Christ, not your possessions, your wealth. If you're not a believer in our Lord Jesus Christ, the only treasure you have is that which is of this earth or of yourself or of the people around you. Come to Christ and he'll forgive your sins and he'll give you treasure in heaven and he will give you meaning to life here on earth and then in eternity with him, with Jesus. Let's stand together and have a moment of prayer and then we're going to have our invitation. Our Father and our God, we thank you that the real treasure is Jesus Christ and the life that he gives. Father, I thank you that he belongs to me and I belong to him. And Lord, I thank you for his people who possess him and are his possession. But Lord, perhaps there are those here today who don't know him as Savior. And I pray that they would receive him into their hearts and lives today. In Jesus' name, amen.